um, some the practical keys, and then we'll also look at some of the um, the life and ministry of uh, some of the. Um, uh, oh, it's not started recording yet. Okay, it's taking a bit of a time. Um, just wait for some time. I'm not sure why. Hmm. It shows recording. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, right it, it but it has told us that it has Yeah, it was actually uh, yes. kind of buffering. That's why. Okay. Now I now I got the icon. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So that's our plan for today. That we look at uh, some of the practical keys of doing the ministry of the pastor. We'll we'll wrap that up, and then go into. Um, uh, we'll we just look at uh, lives of. Uh, maybe uh, I just chose a couple of evangelists, and then uh, we'll we'll look at their lives, uh, and then um, we'll see. Okay. So um, yeah, so let's uh, get started. So this is uh, chapter thirteen: practical keys to doing the ministry of a pastor. So we've looked at various uh, uh, various uh, things that uh, or uh, responsibilities that a pastor has, and you see it's so varied. Um, it's dealing with people. It's it's a little uh, you know you, there is a spiritual aspect of ministry. There is the, um, the 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 administrative or the organizational aspect of ministry. There is caring for the people and so on. So uh, we see um, you know varied um, uh, responsibilities uh, which are there for the pastor. Um, so we uh, so organizationally you know i think we look at um, raising up god's people into leadership and also um, supervise uh, the staff of the congregation um, the people who are on staff uh, in the church and in the ministry um, and also to provide um, spiritual direction for the daily uh, operation or daily living of the congregation and so we we looked at that um, last last class um, the uh, other thing to uh, that the responsibility which the pastor has is also to um, steward the uh, development of um, or develop the stewardship you know, the, of the um, of the congregation of the people in the congregation. You see that uh, you know uh, in order to for people to discover their call. Uh, in order for people to um, walk in the call, fullness of the call, of course, there is the um, the teaching aspect of it. Um, so where the people are, you know, everyone is led to um, to seek God, to look at the Word, to to see how uh, God calls different people and and also to recognize the call of god to recognize the um the voice of the lord um in in one's own personal lives and they establish uh, the spiritual disciplines of reading the word you know seeking god for oneself and uh, and growing in it you know there is that that aspect of it uh, but the best place to um actually um walk walk that out Right to discover the call, to walk that out, and to and to grow in it, uh, is of course the local church, where you have the congregation, where you have the body of believers, and um, like we saw in one Corinthians twelve, it talks about uh, the fact that we are baptized in the body of Christ and uh, the spiritual body of Christ, and each member uh, having different roles and responsibilities and different graces um, by which we might. Um, strengthen one another you know you strengthen another member and you receive strength that you help another member and you receive help and um, god has placed us in the body and there are these uh, membership gifts you know the gifts of the spirit we, we, we call that we uh, we looked at 1 Corinthians 12 you know we see the uh, gifts of the spirit and also Romans 12 talks about the membership gifts where in the body, you know, you there are uh, the spirit of God uh, expresses uh, through the um, through the members, through the uh, through you and I as uh, members of that particular body so that we can be of help. We can serve and receive help as well. You see leadership and compassion and the generosity and, and all those uh, others, uh, others uh, other gifts as well being added. Uh, so, so this is uh, so as a pastor, you know, uh, we need to develop that, right? Um, so that they can they can serve, they can uh, the, the congregation is uh, is able to sharpen uh, you know one another and grow in those areas as well. So, which means that um, uh, uh, in in that area that we 
give opportunities, right? make, uh, create space for people to, to come, uh, come forward with their resources, uh, with the call, with the gifting, and, um, and give a space now, uh, an opportunity to serve, to get trained and so on. So, um, so people come forward with, um, with their time, with uh, their natural abilities, their skill uh, and gifting and uh, finances and so on. So uh, all that, you know, can be, um, you know, how do you develop the stewardship of that, right? Um, so, the, so the pastor teaches, the pastor creates space, creates opportunities for people to, um, to serve in the right way. Of course, you know, being trained, being equipped to ensure that that happens, and uh, and then uh, to serve in the right uh, in the right manner. Right? So, so there's great benefit in uh, in serving in, in the local uh, you know body of Christ. You know, in in whatever way. You know, I started out um, serving as a volunteer uh, at All People's Church. Right? I started out serving as a volunteer. Um, in in worship and uh, and everything literally uh, you know coming and opening the place and uh, putting down putting out chairs and uh, um and also you know taking care of sound whatever little like i could uh, because it was um uh, it was uh, uh you know one of the locations uh, and uh, uh, which we call south apc south and um, this was a smaller location i think at that time when we came in uh, it was about maybe 25 people or 30 people. And, uh, and so it, it was, you know, um, uh, in the early stages. Um, and uh, so it was a wonderful opportunity to serve and to, um, and to also realize um, what your call is, right? And, you know, you, you, re you know that there is the call of God, you know, that God has called you to this and this and, and uh, here is the place where you're, you know, regularly meeting with people and serving in, in simple ways, right? Um, just arranging chairs, uh, taking care of sound, opening the place, uh, maybe coordinating the, the cleaning of the place. You know, even those, uh, sometimes we look at it as non-spiritual and not really get into it. But, um, uh, but you know, uh, uh, I would strongly encourage that we should consider that and, and really do that. Right, um, and uh, and then you get to uh, meet with people. You get to learn a lot of things: how to do, how not to. Uh, we make mistakes. We learn from it, and uh, you know. And, and overall, it's it's really a development of uh, character because uh, you know, a, a, as a volunteer, when you serve, it's uh, you know, it's a, it's a stretch on your time. It's a stretch on your resources, and uh, uh, you know. Uh, so because we were, uh, you know, we were working. Um, uh, I was working in uh, corporate sales uh, uh, with an organization, so I used to travel uh, on um, you know uh, weekdays. Uh, by then, the travel had actually come down, but uh, still there was work-related travel, and so um, so time was a precious resource. So to volunteer, to uh, to be there, to come on a weekday to uh, or a weekend, and uh, apart from a Sunday service, to come there early. We stayed about, um, uh, we still stay about 15 kilometers from that church location. So um, to be able to travel and uh, and uh, I think when we uh, started um, attending and uh, as a family, our daughter was um, how old was she? She must have been probably three years, three and a half years. So, um, or maybe, yeah, less than probably, yeah, three years, maybe, uh, I think, yeah, uh, 2002, 2004, so, yeah, two years, sorry, two, two and a half years. Um, so, you know, to, uh, to go there early uh, and you're serving there. And so you need to start much earlier, right, to go open up the place and so on. So we used to really, you know, kind, kind of bundle her up and go on the bike and uh, and one one side you know there'll be this bag with um, her diapers and diaper change and food and whatever and you know the other bag would would have uh, you know the, the projector because we was taking the projector the lcd projector for the church and so church service and we're taking that and uh, uh, and uh, and there are days when you know you know you don't want to Right, you you get up and you just want to sleep in, and uh, so because we need to leave the house at probably you know seven a.m. or maybe earlier, and go there and and do this, and then 
you know week after week you're doing it so um you learn quite a bit it's um, your character is developed and you begin to do things even though you don't feel like it you know because it needs to be done right it's uh, you've taken on the responsibility and you want to do it um so yeah, so you learn quite a bit right so um as a as a pastor to be able to steward that to be able to give that opportunity to um create space so that a person can come into a team to serve under learn to serve under uh, uh, uh you know a leader like for example um you know in uh, during the week monday to saturday monday to friday the person might be um you know uh, um uh, a business leader it could be a business owner uh, could be a uh, a ceo of a company uh, could be uh, you know a project manager whatever but then um, when you're serving and you're maybe you're handling parking in in the church facility or maybe you're in charge of ushering maybe you're in charge of you know putting out the chairs and, and cleaning things and and it's really a you know it's it's really a humbling experience right and you learn to um steward your time you steward your finances uh steward um your your talents and everything and you begin to grow right so it helps um really sharpen um uh, sharpen a lot of things um in in you as a person in us as a person um so it's a very important aspect again of pastoral ministry to be able to do that right so so people don't just come attend and go uh, people just don't come listen and go but um, they are plugged in to the to the to the life and ministry of the church right to be able to facilitate that now it won't happen to everyone you know of course um you know uh, but we but we need to just make sure that uh, we at least provide those avenues right uh, so the pastor does that provide those avenues think on those lines and say okay how can i you know allow and uh, so it comes with a you know uh, uh, with a lot of other things as well like people may not want to serve may, uh, after some time and uh, etc so that's that's all fine okay um okay and um, uh, i'm on page uh, just a fair reference page 28 in the notes so um also when it comes to uh, when it comes to people you know um there are obviously challenges in living their lives in in i mean all of us we have challenges um challenges would come in several areas right we live in a real world we live in a in, in the natural world uh we deal with you know uh, several things so um we deal with relationships we deal with uh, you know handling of finances we deal with career we deal with you know so many other things so um so um to provide avenues for people to you know when when people face those challenges right so it could be either you as a pastor um the pastor himself or herself is gifted maybe or trained in counseling um so you know to be able to uh, uh to facilitate that okay um or sometimes you realize that okay maybe we can you know we can give a listening ear and uh, you know and uh, and counsel from the word and share from the word but there are some some things uh, which are very complex some challenges which are very complex um some uh, you know difficulties which people go through which are really complex and maybe um you know as a pastor in that season of life you know you don't feel equipped to handle that but still you know people can't wait my right? people the needs are there people's challenges are there so um that needs to be um you know taken care of people need to be ministered so either the pastor himself or herself can counsel or to facilitate to refer to uh, an external counseling ministry right um so that that is that would work perfectly perfectly as well so you you know develop Um, relationship with counselors with counseling ministries and people whom you can trust uh mature uh people who uh, you know counsel from the word um and so you know that's something that you can always refer people to or you know even uh, even it comes to uh, rehabilitation centers or halfway homes and and um, so it's good to develop these contacts and to to find out um how do they do these things and uh, um 
and to refer um, and, you know some of these things um yeah uh, maybe you know it can be uh, people in the congregation some of these uh, uh, ministries uh, uh, some of these counseling centers could be run by people in the congregation or it could be outside of the congregation um as well right so here at apc you know we we had uh, uh, you know uh, people who were trained and gifted in counseling like uh, you know like uh, mrs jean and and the others who are there so could form a team and uh, and um, you know have that ministry counseling ministry, but but the pastor or the lead pastor would oversee it like Pastor Ashish does. So um, so you know that is something that uh, that the pastor, the role of the pastor, um, yeah, it would also you know, look into that and uh, take care of that also, right? Um, and lastly, I mean this is not an exhaustive list, but um, yeah, I think it covers most of the uh, areas um, lastly uh, also would be um, you know several things you know where people come in people journey um, people uh, journey and and, it, and you see that uh, people are spending their lifetime right it's a it's a journey and it's um, it's an exciting journey to see uh, uh, see that happen right so people come and 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 right now you know we are uh, uh, next year we have some weddings happening and these are people who joined uh, uh, you know when they were children right when they were uh, so maybe uh, preteens kind of a, you know and and you know they are considering marriage now so you see that they've lived a huge uh, a major chunk of their life in in church um, so you see people come and uh, maybe they meet their their future spouse uh, potential spouse there in church um and then uh you know you, you take care of their um, marriage preparation process and then of course there is the um uh you know there is the wedding itself to be taken care of right so um so you have a preparation process uh, for them and, and here at ABC of course we have uh, what is called a marriage preparation course uh, you may have um, you know you may have information about that from the uh, marriage and family course right so um, we have that and we ensure that the couples uh, who are intending to be uh, married and being some solemnized by the pastors of the church go through that so they prepare for that um, so that is something that is um, you know based uh, or uh, uh, which is uh, there set in the church uh, started by you know the church so we have that then the wedding itself right so the so the pastor is um, in charge of conducting the wedding so so the pastor learns to do that um, and uh, you know what is the order of service okay and plan with the family okay this is uh, this is something that we have uh, in place in church and so this is how the wedding happens um, so you could have people who are coming from uh, you know the pastor could have people coming from you know non churched backgrounds right so they are the first generation believers so for them um, you know uh, maybe they've never attended a church wedding maybe they've never uh, they don't know what goes into a wedding so you know it's a it's a it's the responsibility of the, of the pastor to teach uh, teach that and uh, and also have a, maybe a sample order of service of the of the wedding and and to take the couple through that and uh, and the families and and so on so it's um you know that process as well um then of course uh, you know when when babies uh, come you know uh, and then there is baby dedications dedications of the babies um in in church so we do that and um so baby dedications are, are simply you know um uh, i know different churches call it by different names but uh, we we consecrate the baby pray over the baby the church uh, you know uh, as congregation as pastors and um uh, praying over the baby praying the blessing of god over the baby and it's a time to also for the for the couple to um introduce the name of the of the child or make public the name of the of the child so baby dedications you know happen and uh, happen there and uh, happen in church and so the pastor gives leadership for that as well okay uh, and of course some of the challenging uh, uh, aspects of um, you know of family uh, 
which is uh, death and taking care of that, right? Death and funerals, uh, burials. Um, so, of course, these um, happen suddenly uh, and at uh, you know at various times. Um, so, to be prepared to have a process in place for that, to be prepared to um, to conduct that, right? Now, um, so it it uh, you know as a as someone who's called into the pastoral ministry, you know, one grows into all these areas. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, one grows into all this, and the, and the Lord, of course, you know, um, there's a, there's a training, and and you learn, you know, uh, you learn as you're preparing for pastoral ministry, and you learn a lot of things as you are in the pastoral ministry as well, right? So, um, so some of these things like funerals and so on you you watch and you learn you you see how um, the other pastors do it and then you learn and you do it also right um also yeah i, I missed out one thing baptisms water baptism um and also um sacraments of the church like we saw earlier you know water baptism communion um so the pastor gives leadership for that okay so these are some uh, you see it's uh, you know it's uh, i think we've kind of spent a lot of time here uh, so it's kind of detailed and uh, um, the responsibility is uh, of course vast and so we sp spend some time on it so um, so just want to encourage us you know uh, we've looked at the evangelist um, um, we looked at the, what goes into uh, the ministry of the evangelist we see the Lord as the example we looked at the you know the teaching uh, ministry the ministry ministry gift of the teacher and we see what goes into it and how the teaching anointing functions and so on and we, we looked at now uh, and there also we see the lord jesus as the example and now we looked at the pastoral um, uh, ministry gift and um, and how it's it's do with uh, what a shepherd would do right um, so we we looked at that as well so the thing is not to get hung up on labels Right, so uh, for for those of us who are just uh, maybe starting off, or maybe uh, considering, uh, or maybe just waiting on the Lord and praying and saying, God, um, you know, I want to serve, um, yeah, but in you know how, what, right? Um, so don't get um, hung up on, or don't get too preoccupied with the label. You know, am I an evangelist? Am I a teacher? Am I a pastor? Um, the best thing is to to be equipped. Like what is happening now, and and in your personal time with the Lord, you know that is uh, that's a that's a great equipping that's happening in the school of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, as we sit and uh, as allow Him to teach now, and start serving. Okay, so start serving. Um, don't look for the ideal place, the uh, you know, ideal audience, and 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 so on. But um, just start serving where you are. Uh, and in small ways that start serving and and may the lord lead um, you know and expand the the influence expand the scope of ministry but be faithful in the small things right uh, be faithful in the um in the in the in what we consider as small right um but uh, just go at it start serving and uh, may the lord lead and uh, uh and and open up those doors for ministry as well right okay so um so that's that's something that i just wanted to uh, encourage us because sometimes we wait you know we wait a long time you know in the sense uh to really step in and start doing it um you know uh, maybe the you know the fullness of the call would happen uh, at a later time but we don't have to wait till then we can start serving in small ways right is there a teaching opportunity is uh, you know you teach maybe it's a uh, you know it's a small group at home and i think that's the best the best place to start um and maybe it's just you and two others or you and another another person a younger believer uh, uh or younger believer in the sense young in the faith um, but start there right um, and uh, it's encouraging and sharing what the Lord has taught, or what you you know what you have learned, and and just start there. Um, uh, if it comes to you know where you feel the stirring for evangelism, you feel the compassion and 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 the compulsion in your spirit to to really you know let people know. Start with family, 
right? Start with family, make a list, start praying. Um, and then, then, you know, you'll be surprised as the Lord uh, uh, opens up and gives opportunities. It could happen as uh, conversations when, you know, in family gatherings, it could happen as conversations in, in, the, in, the, in the most strange, you know, the strangest of places, right? Uh, it could happen, but then now be mindful of that and and just be faithful and share and and that's how you know we start right it's not like we wait and then we we do it no uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you can testify i think uh, you know i've heard from some of uh, you know you you're already doing it so uh, continue to do that right let it pick up momentum um uh, you know uh, and be faithful in what you're doing and be good at what you're doing also you know get um, get into the word get into the, you know, um, reflect on what, uh, how it was done and then say, okay, how can I be better? How can I articulate things clearer? You know, if it comes to a, let's say a teacher, you know, how can I um, articulate it? How can I share this uh, in a better way? You know, what should I avoid and how can I be better at it? Right. Um, So these are some things. Okay. Um, yes, Charles, we are on, uh, we're still on the same page, um, 28 and, uh, yeah, 28 in our notes. Right. Okay. So we'll, we'll stop here, uh, and, uh, we'll, we'll look at the lives of, uh, some of the evangelists, right? So, uh, and, um, I, I just chose a couple of evangelists and, uh, uh, one being Billy Graham and who was, uh, you know, born in the U.S. in uh, North Carolina and uh, Charlotte, I think, uh, yeah, and um, son of a of a dairy farmer, uh, quite uh, well to do and doing uh, very well. And how he started off, he came to know Christ, and um, and then he felt his call to preach the gospel. Uh, he got trained and uh, and then went into ministry. So I just have a couple of, rather than, you know, me just uh, stating the facts, I just thought it'll be good. Um, if I shared the links for the videos, then I thought, you know, rather than that, we could just watch it together and then probably, you know, talk about that um, as well. So uh, I have a couple of videos of uh, uh, Billy Graham. So let's, uh, let's watch that, right? Okay. Um, let me... Just share that. Um, okay. So this is a this is a video which uh, which is made by the by the uh, Billy Graham. Uh, foundation it's called uh, the ministry um, after I think after he passed away so uh, let's watch that time I saw her I fell in love with her and I knew she was the one I was going to marry love at first sight <laughs> and there were three Oops, sorry three in our marriage there was the Lord and there was Ruth and me it was a love relationship. My mother loved my father, and my father loved and adored her. And it was a partnership. Because she's a great student of the Bible and uh, was a real good advisor. She was perhaps his first advisor. There wouldn't be a Billy Graham without Ruth Graham. I said yes to Jesus Christ, and I remember that I put that in the scale, and for the first time in my life, the scale balanced. In the 1940s, as Billy Graham began his evangelistic ministry, he recruited several talented colleagues to help. No one was more valued than Ruth, who was rarely in public view, but was an active advisor to Billy behind the scenes. A team began forming, one that proved to be inspired, as these men served together for decades. He'd written me and asked me to become his gospel singer. And I said to him, you know, the only gospel singer I've ever known about was would sing a verse or two and then stop and talk a while. Would I have to do that? He chuckled and he said, I hope not. George Beverly Shea, a well-known musician and radio personality, became the beloved soloist for the Crusades. As the music and program director, Cliff Barrows would also host each Billy Graham event and program throughout the years. Friends from high school and trusted colleagues, Grady, and T.W. Wilson worked behind the scenes to organize the meetings. 
Long before they enjoyed national prominence, these men held a somewhat impromptu meeting in Modesto, California. It was 1949, just before one of their early crusade events. Bill mentioned to us, he said, you know, we know that evangelists in the past have run into difficulties, have gotten involved in things that have brought disrepute to the cause of Christ. And he said, let's ask God to guard us from making those mistakes. The team decided to hold each other accountable to four virtues, financial accountability, moral integrity, respect for the local church and their pastors, and truth in publicity. It became known as the Modesto Manifesto. And it was through this team that the mission of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association came into focus to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to all they could by every effective means available to them. It was the foundation of integrity that would serve the team well as the ministry expanded beyond their wildest expectations. We were in Augusta, Augusta Georgia. Augusta, Georgia. And along about that time, we, we heard we were going to go to Los Angeles. And it's going to be a big tent. Almighty God says there's going to be a judgment day. The first two weeks drew disappointing crowds, and the committee of leaders that had invited the crusade to Los Angeles considered ending the events. Then in the third week, popular radio host Stuart Hamblin supported the crusade on his radio broadcast, and more publicity was on the way. One night I went and I saw several photographers and there were several reporters trying to interview me all at one time. And I said, what has happened? Why are you here? They said, you've just been kissed by William Randolph Hearst. The media until now had ignored these events, but with interest from the head of the vast Hearst publishing empire, national coverage was almost instantaneous. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has an answer to every burden that you carry. The crusade was extended from the original plan of three weeks to eight. With this singular event, Billy Graham became a household name. It was confirmation of his calling and God's faithfulness. And we're praying that in these days we might see an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, Holy Ghost revival that will sweep our nation from coast to coast. There's a little voice speaking to you now. And even while I'm talking, that little voice is saying, that's what I need. I need Christ. I need God. I'm going to ask you to surrender to that little voice because that little voice is the voice of the Spirit of God. The invitations for crusades continue to pour in from church groups all across the nation. Here in Times Square, I believe spiritual hunger draws people together like this. The next few decades became a whirlwind of opportunity for Billy Graham. And people have come to visit us from all over America and for that part, all over the world. In 1954, a committee of church leaders in England arranged for a series of crusade meetings in Great Britain. At the time, London was the largest city in the world, but the event was threatened by vocal members in Parliament who didn't want the American evangelist to hold a public event there. After much prayer, God opened the doors. And just as the Los Angeles Crusade created a watershed in America, the London Crusade marked a breakthrough in Billy's international prominence. And we're here to honor and glorify only one person, and that is the man in the glory, Jesus Christ. Total attendance was over two million, culminating with a final meeting in Wembley Stadium. Soon the Billy Graham evangelistic team made their way across Europe to places like Stockholm, Amsterdam, Berlin. The message of this book is the message of God. And Paris. You must receive Christ. And in 1956, into Asia, including India. I'm going to ask you to come and receive it. Hong Kong. Before we can have world peace, we must have peace within our hearts. Japan. For God so loved the world. And eventually, South Korea. I want to talk about the greatest man that ever lived. Over a million people from all over Korea came to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ on almost every continent, from Australia and if you come to, God, to Canada, give your life to Christ in it, to Latin America and beyond. That God loves you. God opened the doors to take the good news into all the world. I think there are millions of people around the world that maybe have never heard of Christ. Yet Christ has spoken to their hearts, and they're prepared to listen. And my job is to go and present Christ to those people whose hearts God has prepared. 
As Billy's ministry grew, so did his family. Through the years, the Grahams were blessed with five children. We didn't realize that Daddy was well known or anything, but I guess when, when um, Look Magazine and Time Magazine and Life Magazine would come to the house with Daddy's pictures on the front, we began to realize there's something you know, special here. National prominence brought increased demands on Billy's time, and the call to preach around the world would often keep him on the road and away from his family for several months at a time. Well, sometimes I imagine you feel like a stranger to your own family, don't you? <laughs> uh, well, I really do. The last time I was home, I'd been away seven months. I didn't understand the difficulties that my mother was going through. Saying goodbye to my father, knowing that he's going to be gone not just for a week, but for four months, six months, incredible lady mother i never in my lifetime ever heard her complain never heard her say a negative word about my daddy There's a lot of times i would go down this driveway here with tears in my eyes i didn't want to go because i knew it'd be several weeks or months before i'd see her by the way i want to ask you one question did you go to church last sunday <laughs> could you make it uh, last month <laughs> Did you go last month? Well, you have a winner now. <laughs> Early in his ministry, Billy understood the power of the media to reach more people for Christ. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Hour of Decision. Even hosting a long-running television program and a weekly radio broadcast. Have you received him by a definite act of faith? Billy was a natural television personality. I think Billy went on all those shows because he always was spreading the message. He answered the questions. But it always came back to, Christ is your Savior, Christ loves you. Uh, you've been reading the Bible, I see. Occasionally, you knew about the commandments. Yes, I know. Uh, Ten commandments can be broken in your heart by thought and intent. So in that sense, we're all guilty. And that's the reason the Bible says that everybody's a sinner. Even Ed is a sinner. <laughs> well, that, that's... It comes as quite a surprise. They, they, they... <laughs> Though he never sought fame, he saw that his growing recognition gave him an unparalleled opportunity to spread the gospel. What is your purpose? My purpose is to win as many people to him now, and I'm doing it because he ordered us to. He said, go into the whole world and proclaim this message, that God loves people, that he's interested in people, he wants to help them in their present situation, and he wants to save their souls. People often refer to my grandfather as America's pastor. And I think it would be a term like that my grandfather would blush at because he never set out to be that. Reverend William Billy Graham's untiring evangelism has spread the word of God to every corner of the globe and made him one of the most inspirational spiritual leaders of the 20th century. The international attention would also bring in before American presidents and world leaders. Beginning with President Truman, Billy's spiritual counsel was welcomed by every subsequent president in the nation's highest office. I think it's through him that I found myself praying even more than a daily basis. He would be consulted by men and women of power in many countries on matters of faith, a trusted confidant behind the closed doors of leaders. His reputation is above reproach or suspicion. He's been a Christ-like figure. People see him as the, the great evangelist, but there's a warm, personal side to him that we Bushes have been privileged to see. He was a highly intelligent, highly articulate, highly charismatic man of profound faith who was nevertheless a man. He set for himself the highest possible standards. He has epitomized absolute integrity from the uh, public ministry. You're made in the image of God. You were made to glorify God. He's one of the great evangelists of our nation's history. His crusades are legendary. The size of his crowds were magnificent throughout the years uh, because of uh, the message. And without God, there's an empty place in your life. That could be filled tonight, right tonight, by a simple surrender to Jesus Christ. I consider the call to the ministry the highest and most marvelous calling in the world because it's an eternal calling. And I wouldn't trade places with any president or any king. God was calling me, and I said, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go, and I'll be what you want me to be. I'm yours. 
Our job is to call out a people for his name, confronting the world with the claims of Christ. And that's what we've been doing in our organization. And that's what you've been doing in your churches, scattering seed. And these seeds are seeds of the gospel, and they fall upon good ground and bring forth good fruit. Internet evangelism is one of the most successful evangelistic programs that this organization has ever done. When people have questions about spiritual matters or religion, they go online. So it's important to be there with the gospel. The rapid response team chaplains go at a moment's notice into some of the toughest areas of the world to minister the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The peace that Jesus brings just, whew, it washes over the, the person we pray with. It's been exciting to see what God has done at the Billy Graham Library. Everyday lives are changed. It's about the gospel. We're going to continue our crusades. Tonight you can surrender your life to Jesus Christ and he will forgive you, he'll cleanse you, he'll make you into a new creation. We must prepare the ground and sow the seed of God's Word and water it. What is our message? Christ alone as the Savior of men. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There is no excuse ever for hatred. There is no excuse ever for bigotry and intolerance and prejudice. We are to love as God loved us. Crossing into uncharted territory, Billy refused to allow intense criticism to keep him from sharing the good news with everyone, regardless of race. But when God looks at you, he doesn't look on the outward appearance. His decision to confront racism and injustice in America and other parts of the world raised the respect of many and the ire of others. This is the way, the truth, and the life. Billy had received invitations to preach in South Africa, but refused to do so until he could preach to a non-segregated audience, openly challenging apartheid. Christianity is not a white man's religion, and don't let anybody ever tell you that it's white or black. Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. And he said to the thousands there, apartheid is sin. It, it's, it's wrong. It, it's, it's, it's not right with God. And the papers carried it. I know that God has sent me out as a warrior to preach the gospel. And I must continue until he gives the signal that I'm to stop. In the height of the Cold War, he and his ministry boldly took their message to the communist Soviet Union, where Christianity had been repressed. The hope lies at the foot of the cross. It helped to undermine the communist system. So I think he was one of the forces that kept the window open to the human spirit. I've traveled over this world a great deal now, and I feel that I'm a part of a great mosaic of the human race uh, that God has created, each made in his image, each needing the gospel of Christ, each having the same basic problems and desires and longings, and I'm a part of that. There are many things about God that I don't understand or comprehend. I accept his revelation of himself by faith. When natural disasters cause devastation, the Billy Graham team reached out to those in need, offering physical and spiritual assistance. Living the word of the gospel in prayer and action, they brought hope during seemingly hopeless times. While we preach the cross with one arm, we also give a cup of cold water with the other. He has often been a healing voice and a calming shepherd bringing comfort and solace to a troubled nation during seasons of crisis. This event reminds us of the brevity and the uncertainty of life. We never know when we too will be called into eternity. My prayer today is that we will feel the loving arms of God wrapped around us and will know in our hearts that he will never forsake us as we trust in him. I think one of
yeah we'll uh, we'll take a break and then we'll come back and uh, talk about what we saw okay thank you